All right, my smartphone does say that it is 11 o'clock, so we will begin, but I will share that link. This is by Amy Burval. She has the amazing YouTube channel, History Teachers, and I will share that on Twitter, and I think I'll actually just put it into my slides so that if you get the link to the slides, you can, you can grab that. And it's uh, not only catchy for any one of us who has connections to the 80s and that music, but there's a lot to be said there about the things that we share, the ways that many of us are tweeting and Instagramming and Snapchatting, all kinds of things in our lives. And those topics not only intersect with what we talked about yesterday in the keynote with digital citizenship in the context of health, wellness, copyright, but today talking about security, privacy, and digital citizenship. So um, my name is Wes Fryer. I'm the director of technology at the Cassidy School in Oklahoma City. And I would encourage you to, if you haven't already, uh, go to the link wfriar.me slash oetc18 and that will provide you with these slides on Google as well as the slides from yesterday. And I'll put that QR code and that link up again at the end. How many of you, yes sir? That link is not working for you? Okay, make sure that you've got it case sensitive. So wfriar.me and then oetc18. Um, Give it a shot here. Maybe we're having a DNS. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll be happy to help you with that um, afterwards. And it, the other place you can go is you can go to westfriar.com slash after. And uh, it, they're on a, a Google slideshow. Or sorry, it's on a Google site. It's Google slideshow. Um, and so that can possibly assist as well in getting to the slides. So how many of you have had a creepy online moment with Big Brother? Meaning you perhaps were talking with somebody about something and then you started to see an ad for it on Facebook or Instagram or you bought something or a friend bought something and, and you, you realize there's this connection happening between the online world of, of media and um, the face-to-face -face world with, with what we're saying and what we're talking about. Um, I've had a, an experience like that, and mine actually happened on a Saturday morning in 2016. It involved a bag of Cheetos, and <clears throat> I am trying to eat healthier and uh, exercise more with my wife and those kinds of things, just like digital citizenship, we need to be reminded of, but in this particular Saturday morning, I, I had some Cheetos out and I did have my phone, and uh, I was munching on some Cheetos and a pop-up message on my iPhone said, you really should avoid tempting foods that can lead to binge eating. I'm like, what is going on? This is crazy. And so that caused me to do a little research and I you know, read some things about the privacy settings that we have on our phones and that some apps that really don't need access to the microphone ask for it and we give it to them and so at that time I was using an app like Pacer to track of the sometimes runs usually walks around our neighborhood and it made me really wonder about these kinds of connections like how the heck did my phone know at that moment to you know warn me against binge eating foods so one of the articles I'm going to commend to you and there's a lot in this slideshow and I hope that we'll be able to comfortably make it through these slides that, that I have um, that I really would, would encourage you to read is this one by Walter Kern. This is from November of 2015. And his, his article in The Atlantic is called, If You're Not Paranoid, You're Crazy. And I actually have worn a tinfoil hat one time on the Wednesday night web show and podcast I do with my friend Jason Neifer, you know, laughing at like, are we just going too far here? Because you certainly can. And, and I'm not gonna try to talk us to the edge. In fact, this morning, I think, Perhaps some of that message of, of the keynote was about, you know, be afraid, be very afraid. And I don't think that we, we need to walk around afraid because we know biologically that if we have the fear response, we tend not to be thinking things through and being as rational and reasonable as we can. Uh, but I would encourage you to take a look at what kinds of microphone access that you have. I turned off microphone access to Amazon, Facebook, and Google. And part of the reason was I read Walter Kern's article 
which had me thinking a lot about the hidden information that is continually being gathered about us all the time online by different companies, mostly to advertise to us, but perhaps for other things. So today I would like to talk about two main topics, and I'm going to spend the bulk of the time on the first one, which I will call attention-worthy headlines and vocabulary that specifically relate to our topics of security, privacy, and digital citizenship. And then second of all, I'm going to talk about reasonable responses. How should we respond to these things? Does anybody know, by the way, what that, uh, that wall cave, it's not a cave drawing, but anybody recognize that? It's called Newspaper Rock. It's in New Mexico, and it's pretty amazing. Um, it, I, think, I think it's Anasazi. Obviously click and take a look at it. I guess I have the link there that says Newspaper Rock. But anyway, we've, we've had folks trying to get our attention for a long time, and I think one of the risks that we run uh, with all the data breaches and all the hacks, you know, we're continually being bombarded by headlines, be afraid, be afraid, the specter and meltdown vulnerabilities, which have most recently been in the news, have, you know, been touted as this is unprecedented and it's so huge. Those, however, are still theoretical vulnerabilities. From what I've been reading, there isn't yet an exploit in the wild for those. But there certainly are a lot of, of hacks and breaches as well as malware out there that has been causing damage. So attention-worthy headlines and vocabulary, hacks, phishing, botnets, and artificial intelligence. And I share these with you um, not only to heighten our awareness, but there's a, there's a literacy that I think we need when it comes to privacy and security. And more and more of this is going mainstream. It's not just something for the, the, the propeller heads, you know, tech directors like me uh, and others who are responsible for keeping the internet going in our schools and, and our organizations. And I will be focusing too on what can we do, both organizationally and individually. So, show of hands. Who knows someone who's been hacked? They've had their identity stolen? Do you know someone who has? All right, so that is actually about half the room, which is pretty stunning. Perhaps the topic has drawn people with more knowledge to this session. <clears throat> but as I've been asking that question in the last few years, the numbers are rising. And I think it's good for us all to remember that local stories resonate more than distant stories. And so as we share, hey, this happened to me, hey, this is the, the, the uh, precaution I've taken. How many of us have frozen our credit, like after Equifax? Has anybody done that? That's something that was mentioned this morning in the keynote, and I need to do that. Like that's something that I've been reading, I've been told, and I haven't done it yet. I need to do it, so maybe this is going to push me over the edge. Um, who's used this site? Have I been pawned? Our keynote speaker actually was pulling up screenshots from this website. You can go to this website, how have I been, or just pwned, um, and you can put in your own email address, you can put in your, your superintendent's email address, your spouse's email address, and this will index you to all of the major data breaches and tell you if you have been breached. So for my Gmail account, and this was a few weeks ago, I think when I made this screenshot, um, I had been breached in four different um, incidents. Now, what does that mean? Well, it varies, and, and below each of these it'll say, did they just get your email address? Did they get your password? Did they get your password hints? And, and, and that means that if you, like I was and many people, use the same password on more than one site, then that password is out in the wild. And there are programs today that will take the data from a, from a spreadsheet, from a CSV, a comma separated file, all that data, and as our keynote speaker said, you can buy those for not very much money on the, on the dark web, and then they will check automatically, ooh, do you have a Bank of America account? Oh, do you have a Target credit card? Oh, do you have you know, a, a JP Morgan account? They'll, they'll just scan and check those things very quickly. So the Equifax account, as was discussed this morning in the keynote, um, affected, estimated, 143 million U.S. consumers, and this was in uh, September of 2017. And I think we all know that protecting our social security number is important, but think about how important our phone numbers are, right? We're now living in a day where many of us will not change our phone number. We'll get a phone as a, as a kid, as a teen maybe. We got kids as young as I think first and second grade, that's kind of rare, but usually it's like middle school, you know, that kids are getting phones, and that phone number may be their number. 
So that number can be the key that ties together a lot of data, which we'll talk about as you, you know, eventually shop at Walgreens or PetSmart or wherever you can get the, the um, you know, discount for the value club or whatever. Um, who, how many of us know Brian Krebs? Have you heard of Brian? Excellent. So I highly recommend his book. I listened to his book on Audible a couple years ago, Spam Nation. And oh my goodness, this just really opens your eyes wide to how hostile and how challenging the security environment is globally, right? I think before the, the November 2016 elections, I, like many fellow Americans, <clears throat> had a bit of an overly naive view of Putin and Russia and their aspirations for disruption for our democracy. And it is hostile, folks. And uh, Brian talks a lot about Russian hacking. Uh, this was an article that he published on September 11th about the Equifax bra breach, you know, what was jeopardized and what we should do. He's a great person to follow on Twitter. In fact, I have a Twitter list of security professionals, and that's one of the ways I filter the web. I use an app called Flipboard on my iPad as well as my Android phone, and I'm able to view what these people are sharing in this list. So I have one for security, I have one for AI. Um, it's really great. Let's talk about the Olympics. Did you know the opening ceremony just a couple days ago was disrupted by a cyber attack? This is the New York Times on February 12th, 2018. And according to the article, the attack had been in the works since late last year. It was directed at the organizing committee and incorporated code that was specifically designed to disrupt the games or perhaps even send a political message. Uh, and so it shut down their website, it prevented spectators from printing out reservations, attending the ceremony, and it resulted in an unusually high number of empty seats, okay? So that was two days ago. Um, interestingly and, and importantly, this came from a set of stolen credentials. Credentials, that means a username and a password. And the target of this was um, delivered because the hackers were able to get into their system using the credentials. So, this brings up a good vocabulary word. I know Wikipedia is not the most popular source in all schools, but I encourage our students and teachers to at least use it as a starting point and then look at the references at the bottom, okay? Because then you might be going to Newsweek or US News and World Report or you know different kinds of sources, and it can usually give you a good overview. And so phishing is the attempt to obtain sensitive information, such as usernames, passwords, and credit cards, by disguising yourself as a trusted entity. This is the example of a phishing email. How many of you have had a phishing email in your inbox? You've seen one, all right? Has anybody reported one inside Gmail? Because that's a good thing, I didn't put that slide. It's a really good thing. In fact, some schools are now doing phishing tests for their, for their faculty. Of course, this is phishing with a PH, right? Uh, and, you know, part of that routine is, oh my gosh, look at how bad we are. You know, so many of us clicked on the link. Um, a colleague I know recently did one, and you can pay a lot of money to companies to do these for you. <clears throat> and it said, we've received a package for you. You know, please click here to log in and to, you know, certify, blah, blah, blah. And so lots of, of teachers and staff clicked on that. We need to be as aware as we can about not logging in when we click something in email, okay? As a tech director, I don't want my staff to distrust every link that's sent, okay? Because we're gonna send links that are important. But if you click a link and then it asks you to log in, be wary. One of our peer schools down in Texas has ha had a ransomware attack and the way that they obtained access was through a login that looked like a shared Google document. It had all of the, the Google stuff and it looked legit. Um, we have had spear phishing attacks at our business office. Our CFO and our, our controller have both received messages purportedly from our uh, head of school. And it even was signed in the same way he signs his email. So this was a very targeted. And um, how many of us are familiar with what happened with Access Hollywood, WikiLeaks, and Podesta's email and the timeline? This is from PolitiFact, because I'm not, I'm not going political on us all to, to talk about our fractured political system and polarized 
system, which it's, it's related to what's happening with social media. But anyway, PolitiFact is a website that's won the Pulitzer Prize. I'm thinking about it a little bit like Snopes. You know, is it true, is it false? And they say it's true. WikiLinks dumped the Podesta emails an hour after the video of Trump with Access Hollywood surfaced. And so we are now very, very sure that the hacks into John Podesta, who was the chair of the Democratic National Committee, as well as Colin Powell, were both done by a Russian group called Fancy Bear. And so this is a motherboard article from October 20th of 2016. I don't know how many of you have connections to the military and the government and also the, num the acronym agencies that work with uh, our uh, security forces to keep us safe. Um, but you know, there's, there are limits to the things that they're going to say publicly. Uh, for instance, the Stuxnet attack, who knows about Stuxnet? That's the virus that was created, we think, by Israel along with the CIA to destroy nuclear facilities in Iran. And it worked when a flash drive was taken into the facility, put into the computers, and it caused the centrifuges to spin so fast that the, the, the monitoring equipment said all systems normal, but the centrifuges spun out of control and destroyed lots of stuff. And that, that the government, our government, the United States, did not come out and say, yes, we did, we did Stuxnet. But as time has gone by and researchers have been looking into that, that's their conclusion. So there is consensus today that this group um, used, the uh, Fancy Bear group, used um, a bitly emails, and they've traced this back, so this article talks about how do you know, how, how do they know, you know, this was the source. This Fancy Bear group used bitly links, which had an email embedded, and what did they get Colin Powell and John Vanessa to do? To click a link and then log in to their Gmail account. All right. So again, this is an important thing, and I think they're just going to keep getting trickier and trickier. This is human engineering, and we want to remind people to be careful. Um, and, and one of the biggest things is be aware when you see a login prompt after you click an email. Go to mail.google.com or drive.google.com. Log in from there. Again, on Wikipedia, you can get some background about Fancy Bear. They actually are the, the Russian hacking group that evidently, they think, was behind what just happened two days ago at the Olympics. So spear phishing, phishing with a spear, is another type of security attack. And this is a targeted attack, again, that's specific to an individual. And so I'm going to play the first of a few videos for us. And this one is with the school district I work for for, for uh, four years before I came to my, my present position as a tech director three years ago, Yukon Public Schools. If you're a fan of Garth Brooks, you may know that Garth hails from, from Yukon. He now lives in Tulsa. Uh, but this is, we won't play the whole, the whole thing, uh, but this was a data breach that happened in March of 2016. All the nine Yukon Public Schools is getting teachers and school staff hooked up with resources that can help keep them from identity theft. The district says everyone who worked with them in 2016 had their tax information released. That's about 1,300 people affected. Fox 25's Jordan Lucero is live at Yukon High tonight. Jordan? Just right now at 9 o'clock, a workshop wraps up here at the public uh, the high school library rather, for all UConn Public Schools employees. This is to get them information and resources after that data breach. Okay, obviously not the kind of headline we want. What happened? Uh, one of the administrative assistants in the business office received an email, and in that video, the superintendent comes online and explains. Uh, she thought it was from him. It asked for all W-2 information for all employees, and she just emailed it to him, okay? She didn't see that the email address was not .uconps.com. And so this is something that, especially in our business offices and anybody who's connected to finance, we need to help them you know, be more aware. And I'll talk about two-step verification and complex passwords. Um, it, this is really important because we can all, we've all probably seen the, you know, Nigerian email, you know, help me, I'm stranded, or I've got a business here, you know, help me. And those kind of things are just sent out to everybody. Spear phishing is specific, and I know who's in the business office because I can go to your website. 
and I can get the email addresses of your staff because most of us still don't have a password that protects that. It's just out there. And so these kinds of attacks are going to continue. Um, there's a really good video. I don't know if you um, remember the plain English videos that, um, that came out a number of years ago about the web. And anyway, the, the group Safety in Canada has published a really nice three-minute video. And yesterday, I, I told you about this website we launched in our school called digsit.us, and it is a digital citizenship conversations website, and that is one of several different um, videos that we're going to be adding to the site soon with questions, right? Because all of us, including students, need to be aware of phishing, how we can protect against them. So let's talk a little bit about denial of service attacks and the Internet of Things. Um, how many of you remember, back in September of 2016, all these headlines, um, a big denial of service attack that was called Mirai, the Mirai botnet? Does that ring a bell? A couple people have said yes. So Ryan Krebs, who I mentioned, is one of the foremost security researchers in, on the planet, and he was a big target, and he was a target of a record denial of service attack. What is a denial of service attack? Well, I give credit to the Security Now podcast that Leo Laporte um, does on the Twit Network um, with Steve Gibson, <clears throat> because the way the internet works is we have packets that are sent out, right? And so these packets traverse the, the internet and they go from an IP address to an IP address and they take different routes. Well, a particular computer can only handle so much traffic. And if you get so many requests hitting you at the same time, it can overwhelm the computer. And there are ways that companies try to mitigate this. There's a, a whole network called Akamai. In fact, I learned about that from Apple because they, when they stream live, live events, and many people do, it's distributed around the globe with the Akamai network. Anyway, back in September of 2016, we had this huge denial of service attack, which, among other things, was targeted at Brian Krebs and trying to take him off of the web. And it was done by renting what's called a botnet. Is anyone still aware, and I'm not saying it's you, but you're aware of a friend, a colleague, using Windows XP? <laughs> we just had blood drawn a couple weeks ago at our church, and they had tough books that were, you know, taking all of our information, and they were running XP. And I was like, huh, when are you guys going to upgrade that? Because Microsoft doesn't officially support that with security patches. They came out with one that was, like, totally not expected because we had such a bad security incident a few months ago, but if you are, you know, there's a high likelihood that it'll be infected. You can plug an unpatched Windows XP machine right into the internet at a home cable modem or somewhere where there's not a firewall, and it will really quickly be attacked and have something. So again, check us out on Wikipedia, read about Mirai, the Mirai malware. Why is this such a big deal? Well, this was the largest attack we've ever had. It used hundreds of thousands of compromised devices in what's called the Internet of Things. I don't know if we have any sessions about the Internet of Things, but I mentioned yesterday Home Assistants, right? The Google Home, Amazon's Miss A, whatever you want to call her. I'm recording this and don't want to activate that for people listening. Security cameras, crib cameras. The Nest thermostat, anybody using anything like that? You're using devices at home that connect to the internet. These things were compromised. And so in the attack, it was people's home routers and their home surveillance cameras that have an IP address and can send a ping, sending hundreds of thousands of pings to try and shut down um, parts of the internet. In fact, they estimate that these attacks exceeded one terabit per second, the largest on public record, and not just Brian Krebs, it was also targeting some of the DNS infrastructure that makes the internet work, right? If DNS goes down, oh, you know, I can't type in Cassidy.org and get to my school site because I don't know the IP address. I've got to have that service. Here's the last sentence here. At its peak, Mirai infected over 600,000 vulnerable IoT devices, according to our measurements. Okay, but the story gets more interesting because do you know the Minecraft you know, slant to this? So the two kids, and yes, they're college students, who were the designers and creators of Mirai, were running a service for Minecraft servers. This is a Wired article from December 13th, 2017. 
And what they were trying to do was basically like an extortion racket for you know, the mafia. Um, they, there's an underground market for denial of service. You can buy time on these botnets. And so they designed and unleashed this incredible botnet which tapped into the Internet of Things, to all of these different devices that are in our homes. And the FBI's Walton said it's the most successful IoT botnet we've ever seen and a sign that computer crime isn't just about desktop computers. So many of us are, are you know, putting more and more devices in our homes and also in our schools, and that means there are more targets for hackers. So let's turn from security and privacy now to talk a little bit about surveillance and surveillance headlines, and I put in red there, powered by artificial intelligence. Because artificial intelligence is a big deal, right? This gentleman, Sundar Pichai, is the CEO of Google. And last year at the Google I.O. event, which is their developer conference, he famously said, Google is switching all of their focus from mobile first to AI first. We've had different transitions in computing, right? The, the mouse, the, the, the graphical user interface, um, being able to inter interact with our computers in that way has been a big deal. Touch, you know, the iPhone 2007, that's a big deal. But now artificial intelligence is allowing us to speak and talk and interact. And I don't have it work all the time perfectly. There have been some funny, you know, text message exchanges with my wife and I and some other people because Siri or now I use Google with this Android phone don't always get it right, but it's only getting better, right? And so what Pachai said in, in January is that AI is going to be more important than fire or electricity in transforming our lives and transforming our society. And so if you're interested, we had a, a Google-focused conference called G-Camp in November last year at our school, which I think we're going to do each year. And I was able to present a session called Teaching and Learning in an AI-First World. And so today we're going to focus a little more on, you know, the headlines and the responses to this security and surveillance stuff. In this case, I was talking a little more about the teaching and learning. And you can actually link to the slides as well as an audio recording. I'm actually recording today on my iPad, and I'll publish this. I did the same thing for that session, so if you want to check that out, you can. All right. How many of you are fans of Frontline, PBS Frontline specials, documentaries? All right. Oh, not very many. you gotta, you got to check out Frontline. It's awesome. And this is really an eye-opening episode that's still available online. This is from May of 2014, but it's called The United States of Secrets. And I'm going to talk today not only about surveillance from a governmental standpoint, but also from a corporate standpoint because we have multiple layers. And hey, for school, right? We have a network of 120 security cameras at our school. We push 1.5 terabits of, of video bandwidth up and down every single day, all right? That's a lot of bandwidth, that's a lot of cameras. But this particular frontline talked about how hackers, and these aren't just black hats, they're also white hats, like those working for the government, can get onto our phones. And so when the speaker today was, was picking up the woman's backpack and talking about taking her information, one of the things I was thinking is, he doesn't need to touch her backpack. He doesn't need to physically do anything if her phone is on, and especially if Bluetooth is enabled or Wi-Fi. You do not want to go to Las Vegas at what's called the Black Hat Conference and have a device that's turned on. In fact, even going through customs, I traveled to Egypt and had an opportunity to, to present there in November of this year, or last year. And <laughs> I did a lot of reading about customs officials and what was happening. And you're kind of in a limbo, no man's land in customs. You've landed in the country, but you're really not there. You're, you're in customs. And so the ability of officials to plug in your phone, suck all the, the information off, and then have that be part of a database is, is real. There's thousands of people in the last year who've had that happen in different places. So it's important to know that even if I turn this on, you know, I, even if I turn some things off, you can, you can drive by. And that's what the Kern article that I mentioned and what this Frontline special helps. In, in Nevada, let's just say, in parts of, of the state, you can drive into areas where there's restricted government access and your phone can be scanned simply because it's turned on. And 
they don't have to physically have possession of it in order to scan and find out about you. So this is a July 3rd, 2014 article from Wired talking about how the NSA is targeting users of privacy services. Um, Tor, T-O-R, is an anonymous browser. It actually started as a project that the U.S. government began. It's very important in countries that arrest journalists and worse for talking about officials and things that the government doesn't want to, to have come out. Um, but evidently, users who are using Tor you know, have the attention of the NSA. I'm gonna talk a little bit about Snowden. How many of you saw the 2016 movie Snowden? I commend it to you, okay? Now that's an Oliver Stone version. I also commend to you Citizen Four. Anybody seen uh, Laura, Laura Poitras' version? This is the actual documentary with Snowden in it, right? And this tells the story of how all of this came about and, and tells his story. And I'm sure if we were to do a, you know, a survey to have people say, what do you think about him? What do you think about what he disclosed? You know, traitor, terrible, you know, hero, model citizen. You know, we probably have people with some different opinions. <clears throat> but the point is, we know a lot more about the surveillance happening in our world today because of the Snowden revelations. And we are on a trajectory as a society where surveillance is going to become more and more normalized. I've heard that in London, and this is true in Moscow as well, parts of China, you know, you can't walk outside without being on some cameras. And the ability for governments and societies to track individuals is going to explode in very short, you know, time frame because of artificial intelligence. This is an article from The Verge on January the 23rd, 2018. Artificial intelligence is going to supercharge surveillance. And one of the quotes here talks about a province in western China um, where the Uyghur people are and, and having traveled to China, including Hong Kong, four times since 2007. My awareness of this is greater because, you know, when you're there, you are behind the firewall. You're, you're in a, a different environment in terms of monitoring your internet traffic. Right now in Xinjiang, Traditional methods of surveillance and civil control are combined with facial recognition, license plate scanners, iris scanners, and ubiquitous CCTV to create, quote, a total surveillance state where individuals are tracked constantly in public spaces. And this is similar in Moscow. They estimate more than 100,000 high-resolution cameras covering more than 90% of the city's apartment entrances are there. And interestingly, this article talks also about resolution and how that's a limiting factor. We've had low resolution cameras, relatively speaking. And now with these high resolution cameras, it's incredible what can be seen. And, and this also goes to detection. Does anybody have an iPhone 10, by the way? I didn't put a slide in, but who anybody got an iPhone 10? So, you know, we're, we're seeing this with the facial recognition. I love fingerprint ID, right? I love being able to open my phone with a fingerprint. Biometrics has a lot of good promise for verifying identity. But at the same time, we are all in Facebook's um, facial recognition database. Yesterday, and I took the tag out, I got permission to interview some of our uh, high school students from Ohio at the poster session who were doing great stuff with Scratch, right? And I, I actually put a blog post up, and I, I put the interview up. <laughs> but when I shared the picture on Facebook, do you know what happened? It tagged one of them and identified him by first and last name because his, his privacy and his security settings are such that its database can work. That's all working behind the scenes. But these databases are growing and the technology is going to continue to empower individuals, organizations, and not only nation states but non-state non actors who want to utilize this technology both for good or for what we might consider evil. So I'd like to play a quick 90, or 60 second video about a, comp about a company cited in that article called uh, Smart Ella, and then I'm gonna play a little bit longer one from another company called Boulder AI. And this is gonna give, you, give us an idea and a picture about how artificial intelligence is transforming and will transform surveillance video. And I'll just say this as a, a quick intro. Today, I said, we've got a security camera system as part of my responsibilities as a tech director, which monitor all of our 18 buildings. We have 80 acres on our campus, 
And, you know, there's, there are places where it's not monitored, but, you know, most spots, most doors, we're going to be able to see. But today, we usually just go back to see what happened, okay? We're not actively seeing, hey, did somebody jump over that fence? Hey, did kids gather together? To, you know, was, was there maybe a fight going on? Which we don't have those happen at our school, uh, really. But, you know, we don't have this kind of active observation happening in real time. And this is what Ella is going to is going to do or is doing now. So for the benefit of those listening or watching, you know, uh, couldn't see the, all the text on this video, um, we're talking about active monitoring. So this technology will be able to, dip, can today, differentiate between things like just motion and that was a doll or that was a bird, you know, in my, uh, on my house security camera or, or that was a person delivering a package, you know, or that was somebody I didn't know who was coming up ringing my doorbell and, you know, who, who was that? I'm not sure who that was. And so uh, Smart Ella uses the cloud, and it can take video from whatever security camera that you have, and it will send it up for analysis, and then like it showed in the video, you can Google something like, show me the trucks, show me the Jeeps, and that kind of active observational technology is not a part of most surveillance systems today, but it's becoming part. So another company mentioned in that Atlantic, the Verge article that I just referenced is this one called Boulder AI. And their tagline on Twitter is the cloud is overrated. We do data at the data source. And so the video I'd like to show you from them uh, is a little bit longer. I guess actually this one's embedded. And there's some awesome stuff here. The article talks about, well, <laughs> it's also automation. You know, the ways in which we needed people, for instance, to count fish jumping over a spillway and to know what kind of fish they were from a fish and wildlife management standpoint, they now have cameras that are able to do that, you know, with complete accuracy. How many fish crossed the spillway, what kind of fish they were. They're doing things on the edge, so it's where there's not necessarily connectivity. Let's take a look at this because they'll explain it better than I can. Humans have a significant psychological bias, especially if they're performing security or if they're making some, some kind of classification. A deep learning model is going to be more or less unbiased. Traditionally, we describe artificial intelligence as intelligence related to some form of decision making. It can't be influenced by politics. It is simply information in, information out. It's going to be checked by data, by statistics that is inherently more trustable than a human who is susceptible to all of the above. AI on video is done in the cloud. In a lot of places, the cloud doesn't exist. Our systems don't rely on that internet connection. The processor inside does the distillation of, of image data down to much, much smaller pieces allowed to just send those little bits of information up instead of huge gigabytes with the picture information. This camera could be taken way outside of the grid and perform in very remote areas. It's got the ability to, to go into environments that are freezing cold, wet, to over 120 degrees Fahrenheit. It's using high-performance computer
computing that are able to really deploy an artificial intelligent engine where traditionally it is not possible. That is the benefit of our systems, is being able to put this into a satellite only environment and you know, out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean with the ability to run AI on the camera. So this camera is a, an extremely smart AI ready industrial weatherproof and dustproof camera. At the same time, what is key to the DNN camera is the inference speed. So once you have a very complex model, we want to be able to take that model out into the edge case in real environments. Right, so I'm going to pause that. Um, we need to open the door for our kids to participate fully in the 21st century. And there's a great book that I, I listened to recently called Industries of the Future. You know, genomics, artificial intelligence, these are two of the industries of the future that are huge and getting bigger. On a personal note, our, our son, oldest child, is a sophomore now at Colorado School of Mines. They had a job fair yesterday, and I was asked, telling him about Boulder AI saying, you know, maybe you could visit with them about an internship. I don't know that he's going to go that track. But we need ethical folks to be writing the code, using these systems, and implementing these. And I am very confident that in the United States, we will have some voices quite different from those in very authoritarian countries, some of which I visited, who are going to be implementing these systems and using these systems. So on that note, China has just introduced for the lunar, um, a lunar celebration, the Chinese New Year holiday, these glasses that remind of Google Glass, and they have built-in AI for facial recognition with a database of 10,000 people. And so the articles that I was reading, they cost about 636 US dollars per unit, and they can identify suspects in about 100 milliseconds. Uh, now, I think it's very different, but it's very crowded, it's busy, you know, versus like one person or just a few people. But again, I don't know if you watched Minority Report with Tom Cruise, makes you think about stuff like that, right? <clears throat> the technology may not be that great today, but exponential change and exponential growth tells us this is going to happen quick, right? Um, Ray Kurzweil has some great TED Talks about AI and the singularity, and he said, when we only had mapped 1% of the human genome, people were saying, oh, this is never going to happen. Is this even worth it? And Kurzweil said, hey, we're almost done, because he understands exponential growth and how fast stuff can change. So I'm not going to play this whole video, but this is from the Wall Street Journal on February 7th, 2018. Again, this is about the Chinese police adding the facial recognition glasses to their surveillance arsenal. And by the way, I, I have a, an ad blocker on, right? It's very helpful when we're teaching and presenting to not have to see pre-roll ads. Um, the one, this is in the side. My wife told me not to bird walk in my presentation. Um, this is called uBlock Origin, and this works for Firefox as well as Chrome. It's one of the ones we recommend to all of our teachers because it stops your advertisements on websites from popping up. And some websites will actually not let you view the content. Um, but this one, I've got the Chrome version installed, it's available for Firefox, it's called uBlock Origin. That's my, my free little, in our Wi-Fi, may I, a lot of times I'll download video in advance, I'm trusting the Wi-Fi, so far so good. Surveillance is everywhere, I'll read the English because this is in Chinese. There are armored cars and tanks on the streets. There are no limits to what they can do. Life inside China's total surveillance state. Now this is a nine minute clip, we're not going to watch the whole thing. So we're here in Urumqi, which is the capital of Xinjiang, in a market downtown. The security here is incredibly tight. There are armored cars on the streets, police stations on every corner, and tons of surveillance cameras. In the past year, police have stepped up security. The region is now under what's probably the most intense government surveillance in the world. Here, China is experimenting with futuristic spying technologies. For years, China has tried to suppress a separatist movement made up of Uyghurs, a local ethnic group. Authorities say the separatists are Islamic terrorists. We came to see what life looks like 
in a place where your every move can be monitored. To be in Xinjiang means being checked every day, multiple times a day. When you go to a market, when you drive a car, when you take a train, even your smart... Alright, so a little buffering. I don't, wanna, I don't have time to show the whole thing. But that is linked, and, and what I'd say about this is, this is giving us a preview into the possibilities of what the surveillance, where surveillance can go, right? And we are utilizing these technologies right here. We're using them in our school. I'm sure you're using them at your school as well, to a degree. And we will have choices as technology leaders, as administrators, about the degree to which we will utilize these and how these are going to be, to be used. So, let's take a little bit of a time. I think we've got about 20 minutes left, 15, um, to talk about responses. And I subtitled this, the sky is not falling, but the times are changing very fast. First, of course, this is unclassified. I was only in the Air Force a short time. I don't have a security clearance right now. I'm not revealing anything that is, that is classified. These are all openly cited um, you know, news articles. And my goal is really to be in between paranoia and naively oblivious, because I think <laughs> that, that's a continuum. And I want to, for myself, my family, my organization, uh, not to be naively oblivious, especially when it, it comes to things like data breaches and identity theft and ransomware and things like that that can threaten, you know, individual wealth as well as, as school finances and, and just safety and security. I asked this yesterday in the keynote, let's ask this group, how many of you at your school today require two-factor authentication? Is anybody doing that? So, awesome, awesome. Um, I, I think, and our keynote just said that this morning, this is the future. Why? Because we usually don't have great passwords, and using another device, and the phone is not foolproof, right? You can, there's ways to bypass it if you smart, if you sweet talk the AT&T or Verizon or T-Mobile, whoever's, you know, controlling the, the SIM card. There's, there are stories of people who, who've been hacked, even with two-factor turned on, you know, because their SIM card. There's different ways to do this. You can use a security key, you can use an app. I, I actually like the app Authy. Um, but you know, 90% of Gmail users today, and that includes Google Apps for Education, don't use two-factor. This is from January 23rd, 2018 in The Verge. So it's not a surprise that only three of us in this room are doing that at our school. It took over a year. We were educating faculty. We sat down and not only talked about two-factor and helped teachers get that set up, but we also talked about password managers. And so that brings me to security best practices. Okay, hint, it, the best practice is not to change your password every 90 days or six months. And we've had a lot of systems that have told us to do that. Why? Well, here's a headline that should have all of our attention. USA Today, August 9th, 2017. Password expert says he was wrong. Numbers, capital letters, and symbols are useless for passwords. And this is from Bill Burr, who is the author of an eight-page publication released by NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology and he released this in, 20, in 2003, and he says that basically institutions took that and turned that into protocol. And the problem is the combinations that most people use aren't secure because people choose predictable combinations. And I don't have the list here, but you can Google the most, you know, 10 most common passwords. And you know, password and password one, two, three, and things like that are on it. So, I recommend that personally we add two-step to every web account we can. If you bank online, you have a credit card, you have your insurance, you know, anything that you can add, two-step to, add that. And we need to consider at what point we're going to require our faculty and staff to do this. Now we have actually one teacher who doesn't have a smartphone. He doesn't have a television in his house either. And so what we did for him was for $10, there's $15 now, I think. You can get what looks like a USB key, but it's a security key, and you plug that in when you do your two-step. And so he has that on his key ring, and he's able to do his two-factor authentication. With Google, we've been a Google Apps school for the last seven years. <clears throat> it will ask you on new devices every 30 days, okay? So if you use a different browser or a different app, it's gonna prompt you. 
And we've actually had people need to delete their settings in their smartphone because they set them up a long time ago with, with you know, they were set up differently with, with server addresses and whatnot. When you set up a new account, and I think you have to have, you can't go back too far with iOS. We had somebody on an iPhone 4 and, and that wasn't working. She had, she had to move up. But there's, there are different ways. You don't have to use a smartphone. Um, and we're not telling people they have to use their phone for email. We're just saying we need you to have a secondary way of verifying your identity. And here's the next part. This is, the, this is just as hard. Always use a complex and unique password. Who feels good about that today? Like on most websites, you're using a different password. If you had asked me that two years ago, I would have said, you are crazy, Wes. Why are you even dreaming that that could happen? This is... I think the only way it becomes possible, and it's with a password manager. Again, we heard our keynote speaker talk about this. The one we recommend to our faculty and staff is LastPass because it's free for individuals. We do not provide this as a school. We do not want the liability that would come with this, all right? So one of the most important things is to help teachers and staff print out, yes, print out their master password and then treat that like a social security card or a passport, put it, I say, please put it with that document at your house or in your fire file or wherever you keep those, those documents. Because if you lose your last pass password and you haven't put in your phone number for recovery, I can't help you. And this is also personal survival for our tech department and I. A lot of the pain points when we're working with teachers, the, the most tense, very stressed out moments have to do with passwords. Who's had the fun of resetting a password with, with Apple? Have you, have you done that with the Apple ID? One thing to remember is if it's easy, it's probably not good security, all right? And Apple makes it intentionally um, challenging for us to get things reset in new devices because they need good security. So use complex passwords um, and definitely, and, and we've got John right here, I'm so glad that he was saying that, you know, talk to people about password management. This isn't just for us in school. This is for your parents. You know, if you've got grandparents still with, you know, with us, it's for everybody. It's for your neighbors. This is life in the 21st century, okay? So Google has, I think, a good system for two-step verification. Um, and like I said, it took us a year to get that implemented, but now all of our faculty and staff are on board. What about privacy? How many of you have heard someone say this or you've said it yourself? I'm not breaking the law. I'm not trying to subvert American democracy. Why should I care? Have you heard kids say this? We heard in the keynote some people talking about students having different perceptions of, of privacy perhaps than older adults. Well, <sighs> privacy matters, okay? In fact, if you look at every social change movement in the United States that has changed things, like slavery, like women's suffrage, like the civil rights movement, they have involved authorities surveilling and keeping track of what folks were doing. And I love our country. I love our Constitution. I don't want to live anywhere else. All right? We got to not only fight on... <laughs> the battlefront of conflict, potentially, for those values and for those rights. We, when, when you become an officer in the military, you pledge to support and defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And so we shouldn't assume that authorities are always going to be benign. Let me give you a couple examples outside the United States. This is March 16, 2016. Cambodian student imprisoned for revolution Facebook post. He posted on Facebook, the first year student from Kim Track University, um, a message calling on Cambodians to call him, to join him in a color revolution to change the government. And he spent 18 months in prison for that. This is October 25th, 2016. Iran sends an American, a 46-year-old from San Diego, to prison for collaborating with the United States. In his hearing, they presented his Facebook and social media posts in 2009 that were in support of the Green Movement in Iran, pro-democracy demonstrations that have happened. Our country has, at times, this is from October 2016, The Verge, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram surveillance tools used to arrest Baltimore protesters, right? And, you know, we need a good homeland security capacity. 
Absolutely, we need to know what's going on. But we also need to be aware of the ways that, that lines can be crossed. And so this is an interesting Intercept article from November of 2016 um, talking about how perhaps we need to think about uh, ways that we're going to be able to um, defend ourselves against surveillance if our country continues to, to march down this road of, of a ubiquitous surveillance. So let's leave the, the government stuff behind for a minute. Let's talk about corporate. Um, how about Google? Personally, I've drank the Google Kool-Aid. I believe it when they say we don't want to do evil. I really, really love Google tools, and I'm very, very positive about us using these tools at school. And one of the reasons is because Google discloses so much of what they have about me. Go right now to history.google.com. Take a look at all the stuff that Google has recorded. You know, if you use a Google Assistant and you speak into it, it records your voice. You can play your voice saying everything that you've said into it. You can also delete that information. You can choose not to have it saved or shared. And you are the only person, as long as you're not hacked, who can see that data. Do you know this story about Target and the girl who was pregnant? And how Target knew about her pregnancy before her dad? Um, this was in Forbes magazine on February 16, 2012. How the heck did this happen? Well, it was tracking behaviors, things that possibly she was buying, looking at. And so her dad was very angry because they sent some marketing materials for, you know, a pregnant woman uh, to her. And it turns out, you know, she was pregnant and dad didn't know that. Target knew that before her. How many of us use rewards programs? Okay, Walgreens, PetSmart. I just have started telling them when they ask me for my phone number, I've decided to say no to uh, corporate surveillance. And they're looking at me like weird, whatever. But these connect the dots, right? Does it matter they know what kind of dog food I buy or that they know I just bought some acetaminophen? All of this is going into the cloud and these are some of the personal decisions that we have to make. But what about our kids? In 2011, 92% of all children had an online presence by age two that was created by their parents. And that's from the Note to Self podcast. And that podcast turned me on to this ProPublica um, series, which is great. It's called Breaking the Black Box, talking about what Facebook and these other companies know about us. Here's a free extension that you can download and use right now. What Facebook thinks you like. It's kind of surprising. And this has actually caused me to unlike things and change some things and, and, and not just, you know, give away all the information that Facebook wants me to when I use it. Again, our keynote speaker today reminded us about privacy and recommended the checkup, so absolute thumbs up to that. This is a link to the Facebook privacy checkup and how you can find it. And I've been reconsidering, you know, how I have an open Facebook and do I, how, what do I want to change? What are the things I want to change? Here's a book to add to your reading list. This is Julia Angwin's 2015 book, Dragnet Nation, A Quest for Privacy, Security, and Freedom in a World of Relentless Surveillance. And lastly, let's talk a little bit about black hat hackers, right? I mentioned yesterday in the keynote that many parental monitoring software programs are actually spyware that stalkers are using to stalk their ex-spouse or you know, someone else. And so we need to take this seriously. James Comey, before he was you know, removed from his position as head of the FBI, he testified before Congress and he said it multiple times, everybody should cover up their laptop camera. That's not a tinfoil hat fringe thing, it's legit. It's so easy for somebody to gain access to your webcam, to your microphone, and it probably is a good idea to wipe or erase our computers periodically. Um, Quad9 is a new domain service, it's the domain address, Google, you know, is 8888, quad 9 is 9999, and you can use this at home or even at school, and it helps filter out malicious domains that are trying to fish or install malware on your computer. Ryan Krebs has a great article, three basic rules for online safety. If you didn't go looking for it, don't install it. If you installed it, update it, and if you no longer need it, remove it, all right? And that's great advice. I mentioned Tor. If you're going to do a search for something um, that you don't potentially want to see ads for, and this could even be like if you're looking for an Alcoholics Anonymous, I've heard these stories, you could be looking for local AA groups, and then you start to get ads in Facebook or Instagram for alcohol companies, all right? Or it could be about a medical condition. 
Consider using Tor, which is using a technology to be anonymous, okay? Consider supporting the work of the EFF, and this is where students can come in as far as advocacy. What do students think about this? Do they think they need to be advocating for this? And lastly, let's promote awareness, encourage student voice, and advocacy. And that's the, the digsit.us website. So please, provide us with feedback. Let me know how that website can be better. We're using that at school this year to facilitate conversations. But as I said yesterday, I know these are conversations that need to happen everywhere. It's not just in school. It's in our communities. It's in our churches. Uh, it's in our homes. And so you can follow me on Flipboard. I have a couple uh, magazines there about digital security, um, surveillance, and privacy. Let's use our digital tools for good and not for evil. Um, we certainly can get paranoid and we can get scared. And my Cheeto story, you know, reminds me of, of how privacy settings are important on our smartphones. But I hope the suggestions that I provided with you today are going to be ones that you can not only think about and consider and possibly be a little more hyper aware of, but practically take these conversations back to your community, back to your teachers and your students with some suggestions about how to be safer. Um, and then the role that we, we need to play as citizens with regulation, with the, the kinds of limits that we want to have on our own, um, the right that we want to have to our own data and to data privacy and to the decisions that we make. So I'd be welcome. Any questions that you might have, and thank you so much. Appreciate your time.